And a lot of people wonder, you know, wh- why? Why are you talking so much about the Torah and the law and all that stuff? And, and, of course, anytime I make any suggestion that it might be a good idea for us to actually obey God, people go crazy on you and think, oh, you're being a legalist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they usually throw the uh, whole 613 at you. Oh, well, are you uh, are you keeping all 613 commandments? Uh, as if they actually know what they're talking about. Um, first of all, the 613, that's rabbinic. Now, it, it may be true that, you know, as I understand it, a rabbi sat down and counted every time God said do this or don't do that and um, came up with the number uh, 613, that there were a, a total of 613 times that God said do this or don't do that. Um but when people throw that argument at at you, well, you know, are you are you keeping all 613? They they really don't know what they're talking about. So I decided, well, I'm I'm going to write something about that. So I wrote a note called 10 or 613. And I said, when it comes to keeping the law, most of my posts usually revolve or really revolve around the 10 commandments and the feasts. And I might also add to that uh dietary laws and things like that. Um but still, time after time, people come at me with the question slash accusation, are you keeping all 613 alleged commandments of the Torah? As if to try and trap <laughs> Look, guys, no one, no one, not even Yeshua himself, could keep the so-called 613 commandments. A lot of them are only applicable to the Levites. Yeshua, of course, was from the tribe of Judah. Many require the physical temple in Jerusalem, which is now gone due to the will of Yahuwah, I might add. A fair amount apply only to women. Yeshua, well, he was a he, not a she. There are those that apply only to farmers. Yeshua was a carpenter slash rabbi and not a farmer. Some require a court system of Torah observant judges and others apply only to kings. Now, the first time Yeshua came as the suffering servant slash sacrificial lamb and not as a judge or king, et cetera, et cetera. So in this lay person's opinion, there really is no valid argument for keeping all of the so-called 613 laws of the Torah. It is simply not possible for anyone to do so. You'd have to be a circumcised female Levite king working in a stone temple in Jerusalem as a priest with a side job of being a court judge who enjoys farming, all right, to keep all of the alleged 16, 613 commandments of the Torah. Therefore, let's worry less about the alleged 613 and get back to the simplicity and beauty of the Ten, which were actually written by the finger of Yahuwah himself. I mean, that should, like, tell us something. You know, I mean, it was actually written with his own finger in stone and placed into the Ark of the Covenant, which was a picture of something that is eternal in heaven. These same laws were then written by the hand of Yahuwah once again, but this time not on tables of stone, but on flesh, on our heart and mind, according to Hebrews 8, uh, verse 10 specifically, and thus illustrate our love for him through obedience, through our obedience, 1 John 5, 1 through 3. Anything else is sin, 1 John 3, 4. Even the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, let, sin, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin? Remember, sin is defined by John in the scriptures as transgression of the law. And Paul says, what? Shall we, let's just go ahead and say it, transgress the law because we are not under the law but under grace? What does he say? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? It's not nearly as complicated as some are trying to make it. Do we keep the law for salvation? Absolutely, positively not. Are any of us perfect? No. Will we fail? Yes. But praise Yahuwah for 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. 
And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if we screw up, we've got an advocate. Verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. What is the love of God? First John 5 tells us this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And it is perfected in us. For he who keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Now, we're talking about Yeshua here, so how did he walk? Well, he walked in obedience to and out of pure love for his Father. It's not rocket science. Yet, you know, if you read some of my Facebook posts comp and the people who are commenting on these things, you'd think that, like, this is like trigonometry or something. Um, and, and I'm finding that most of the arguments stem from a misunderstanding on who we are. And so that prompted me to write another one called, Who is the Church Anyway? And uh, there's a, several things. Let me just kind of back up here. I'm going to look through some of these things because um, dispensation theology is really where I see the problem, where, where everybody's getting completely thrown off track. Um, because it, and it's, a, it's an identity crisis also. Well, the church, we, you know, we don't have to do any of this stuff. Well, but the church is Israel. I mean, that's why I had to sit down and write down a, kind of a thesis on, okay, who is the church? Are we something new? Are we something apart from Israel? Well, let's see. Stephen says in Acts chapter 7, verse 38, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness. <gasps> church in the wilderness, and the context is the Israelites at Mount Sinai. Huh. With the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. As you can see, it clearly says the church was in the wilderness. The word used throughout the Old Testament for congregation slash assembly in Hebrew is virtually the same in terms of definition as the Greek word later used in the New Testament for the church. It's just an assembly of people and in context, specifically those called out ones gathered together under Yahuwah. The word used here in Acts 7 is exactly the same as the word used throughout the New Testament for church. It's ecclesia. Strong's number 1577. Look it up. That's the word that's used everywhere in the New Testament for the church. It's the, it's the word ecclesia. Strong's 1577. Same exact word used in Stephen's testimony in Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Now, of course, your run-of-the-mill dispensationalist, however, believes that the church began in Acts 2. Well, not so. We can clearly see otherwise. Y yes, it did begin at Pentecost, but it was the first Pentecost at Mount Sinai, not the one in the first century. In Romans 11, Paul clearly teaches that when we believe in Yeshua, we are grafted into the cultivated olive tree, which is the original church, Israel. Romans 11. I I've come to really love Romans 11, because it really clears everything up. I mean, just read Romans 11. For crying out loud, I'll read it for you. Beginning in verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their, salva through their fall, salvation is Gentile for to bring them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciliation, or the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy... So are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the fruit of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. 
But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear, for if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. In Ephesians, again, Paul, writing here, we read in Ephesians 2, beginning of verse 12, that at, time, at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Far off from what? The commonwealth of Israel, the covenant of promise given to them. Hello? Verse 19. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. With what saints? And fellow citizens of what? Of Israel and the covenants given unto them and the household of God. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, who were all of Israel. Jesus Christ, who was of the tribe of Judah, himself being the chief cornerstone of what household? Israel! In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. And in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The same sort of language is used to describe the bride of Christ, a.k.a. the church, in Revelation 21. There we see that the new Jerusalem is referred to as the bride of the Lamb, who is Christ. Thus the bride of Christ, the church, is Israel. Revelation 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, we all refer to ourselves as the bride of Christ, right? Well, what, how is the bride of Christ defined here? Revelation 21, beginning in verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Who's the lamb? Christ, the bride of Christ. Talk about, I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the bride. Verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. The new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. Keep reading Revelation 21 and you'll see the, that the new Jerusalem is in no uncertain terms defined by the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 gates with the 12 foundation stones of the apostles who come from Israel. There's no 13th gate called the church, guys. And as you keep reading, you see that the Lamb's Bride, the New Jerusalem, is clearly defined by the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, no 13th mystical gate uh, is anywhere in those descriptions. Okay, now let's go back to the original site of the wedding, which was Exodus chapter 12, and verse 6. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the month, and the whole assembly, the Hebrew kahal, assembly of people, Greek plethos, bunch of people, of the congregation, Hebrew adath, Greek synagogues, which is the Jewish equivalent of a modern church, of Israel, shall kill it in the evening. Talk about the Passover lamb. Compare with scriptures such as Matthew chapter 18, verse 17, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. The Hebrew Matthew, the Hebrew version of Matthew, says, Wim lo yishma, I'm not even going to try to pronounce all that, but anyway, el hakahal, which is the assembly. 
used there twice. In Greek, it says ecclesia, used there twice in Matthew 18, 17. So we see the uh, similarities right here. All through Scripture, beginning with Abram, we see a people that is called out by God, and it is and always was called out people throughout the Bible is Israel. Stephen understood that in Acts 7.38, just as Paul understood it in Romans 11, Galatians 3, Ephesians 2, and elsewhere. And John, as if to totally clear up the matter, was told by the angel in heaven that the new Jerusalem was the bride that is the church of the Lamb. Scriptures cannot be more clear on who the church is. Constantine, Darby, Schofield, Larkin, et al., and those who subsequently followed after their exceptionally flawed teachings are the ones who confuse the matter. The church was married to Yahuwah on Pentecost, but not the one in Acts 2. On Mount Sinai, Yahuwah exchanged vows with Israel, saying, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Now, I'm going to pause right there and read something to you that I just wrote today, as a matter of fact, this morning, as I was thinking about the sign between uh, Yahuwah and his bride. You know, the language used there, I'll be your God and you'll be my people, that's marriage language. That's where God's, he married Israel. Uh, that's when Israel became the bride. Um, and we see that his commandments serve as to, to be a sign between him and his people. Uh, incidentally, like a mark that, that will be on your right hand or your forehead. Uh, that should give us pause to think because there's a counterfeit of that that is also a mark on your right hand and or forehead. The counterfeit. Now, when I was thinking about the sign between Yahuwah and his bride, I got a picture of the Ten Commandments there. Uh, and I say, so I've been thinking about the marriage of Israel and Yahuwah at Pentecost. Now, that would be the first one at Mount Sinai, which birthed the church that is his bride. What if we thought of the Ten Commandments less as commandments and more like wedding vows? Think of them more like, well, maybe like the wedding band that we wear, which serves as an outward sign to anyone else that you belong to another. So if we go with that analogy, this would be the ten wedding vows. I will not have anyone else in my life before you, for you are my spouse. Two, I will not make images of others that may distract me or draw me away from you. Three, I will not destroy or defame your name. Four, I will remember the anniversary of that special day you gave me rest. Five, I will honor the parents you gave me. Six, I will not kill the people you made and love. Seven, I will not commit adultery against you. Eight, I will not steal from you or anyone else. Nine, I will not lie about you or anyone else. Ten, I will not covet because you have provided everything I need. Pretty interesting marriage vows, wouldn't you say? It seems to put things into a little better perspective, doesn't it? It also helps us understand why breaking these vows makes our spouse, that would be with a capital S, unhappy, and why keeping them proves our love for him, First John 5. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments, parenthetically, wedding vows. For this is the love of God. People say, I love God, I love God, I love God. What does it mean to love God? Well, it tells you this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, parenthetically, wedding vows. And his commandments, parenthetically, wedding vows, are not grievous. Now, on the flip side, can you imagine someone arguing that they no longer need to keep their wedding vows? Uh, go ahead and try that. And um, If you're married, let me, let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not going to work out too well. And, of course, right off the bat, somebody comes on there, is quoting Galatians 4, uh, saying basically we don't need to do that anymore. So I'm like, are you saying you no longer want the wedding vows on your heart and mind? Because that's where they're written now. They're supposed to be, if you're a believer. And that you'd prefer to toss out the sign between you and your spouse that shows you are his and love him? And, of course, you know, people go off still. <laughs> I, Man, it just... Uh, boggles my mind. I uh, ended up not only posting several notes this week, but I posted a bunch of um, pictures as well. Started getting a little carried away probably, but you know, I just, I couldn't help it. You know, I, I'm like, I posted one with uh, Paul. Uh, it shows him falling off of his horse. And I say, seriously, do you really believe Paul was called by Yeshua himself for the purpose of commissioning him with the task of contradicting every other author of Scripture? 
Do you really believe that? Do you really think he was led to Arabia, as Galatians 1 tells us, and, and Galatians 4 tells us that Mount Sinai is in Arabia? So do you really think that after he got knocked off his horse and the, the scales fell from his eyes, and he said, look, I didn't go to Jerusalem, I didn't go to the apostles, I didn't go to anybody, I went to Arabia, where Mount Sinai is. Do you really think he was led to Arabia to be taught by Yeshua himself to contradict everything Yahuwah commanded at Sinai? Really? Do you really believe that? Do you really believe Paul taught that Gentiles would be grafted into Israel only to then cause that same Israel to then go against everything Yahuwah said would be a statute to them forever? Really? If so, you may need to rethink your theology. Just saying. And, of course, that spun off, uh, let's see, 188 comments <laughs> so far. Uh, so then I put another one. I said, okay, I don't buy dispensation theology because uh, – and I got a picture of Yeshua. And uh, there's a caption. It's a picture of Yeshua like at the um, Passover meal, some would say the Last Supper, with his followers around him listening to him. And I got a caption saying, Jesus never said, okay, guys, here's the deal. Even though all of my first believers are Jews – I'm going to knock this dude named Saul off a horse, change his name to Paul, then create something new called my church out of the Gentiles he's going to reach, which will be separate from you. And I'm going to get this Paul dude to write a bunch of books that will totally contradict everything you've ever been told my father wants you to do. Then at the end of the age, I'm going to rapture that church out and then come back and beat the snot out of you. Got it? Okay, good. See you soon. Bye-bye now. And shalom. Um... Yes, it's, it was intentionally meant to be over the top. In the caption I wrote, you know, maybe I don't know, perhaps this picture is over the top, but sometimes I think it takes the ridiculous to illustrate the obvious flaw in a certain point of view. It seems to be the only way to get some people to actually think about what they believe. It's why many use satire to make commentary against the absurd. Reading through the many responses I get from Christians to just about anything I post concerning <gasps> gasp, actually obeying God, I can see that the problem really seems to stem from dispensation theology. It has done much damage to the understanding of Scripture. In my opinion, you simply cannot separate the church from Israel and expect to have any idea what the Scriptures or Paul are saying. Dispensation theology ignores Stephen's testimony in Acts 7.38. It denies the grafting process of Romans 11, 11 through 33. It tosses out Ephesians 2 and completely disregards the clear description of the Lamb's bride in Revelation 21, while simultaneously, simultaneously convincing us to take a sharpie to 1 John chapter 2 through 5 as stuff not applicable to us in this quote-unquote church age of grace. Now, by way of disclaimer, I do not believe Paul was a heretic who contradicted everyone else in the Bible. I believe he was in perfect harmony with all of them, and I absolutely love the writings of Paul. Thus, all I can say is I'm really glad Yeshua never said nor taught anything even remotely close to this, as what I've depicted in this picture. Since he did not, I have to wonder why so many essentially teach and defend exactly this sort of theology. It literally boggles my mind. And that's why I, I had to write some of the things that I wrote this week regarding um, our identity crisis. Who or what is the church? Let's go back to the who is the church note. The church was married to Yahuwah on Pentecost. Again, not the one in Acts 2, but on Mount Sinai. Yahuwah exchanged vows with Israel saying, I'll be your God and you will be my people. But he later divorced Israel because she constantly chased after other husbands, such gods, and continuously disobeyed her husband, doing that which was wrong, detestable, and adulterous. Jeremiah 3, 8, And I saw, when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce, yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. The only way the adulterous wife could be freed to remarry is if the husband dies. That's according to God's own laws. So what did the groom do? On that shortly. We must acknowledge that all of the first Christians were of the Jews and of the tribes of Israel. Pentecost caused 3,000 from the lost tribes of Israel to get saved. It was only in the ministry of Paul that Gentiles began to come into the fold. 
But he was quite clear that they were being grafted into the cultivated olive tree that is Israel, thus being adopted into the family of God. Now, I'm going to stop right here because people, they started calling me uh, supremacists or whatever. So, uh, there's, this one guy just graduated from seminary. He's going off on me saying that I'm in some kind of heresy called supremism, uh, something like that. I don't know, you know what it was. Seminaries like to come up with all these labels. You know, It's like that's what they teach people. Or that I'm into replacement theology or all kinds of other nonsense. No, I'm just reading the Bible. And when I got married to Sheila, she had a 13-year-old son who had a different last name. His last name was Garcia. I didn't want my son, because I'm going to marry Sheila, and she comes as a package deal with her son. I didn't want somebody to have a different last name. I wanted him to have my last name. So I adopted him. And the adoption process so clearly illustrates what happens to us as I will say, former Gentiles, after we become believers. When I gave Jeremiah my name, my son, you know, he has my name. He then has all the rights and privileges of my family. He shares in my heritage. He participates in, in whatever customs we, the Skibas, have. He, he was a Garcia. I adopted him. His name change is now Skiba. He identifies himself as a Skiba. Now, his ethnicity is not going to change. He still he still has the blood ties to his uh, his father, who had the last name Garcia. That, that's not going to that, that's not going to change. His ethnicity remains the same. His his blood tie remains the same. However, his identity has changed. He is now a skiba. He does what skibas do. And when this skiba dies, he's going to inherit whatever I have to leave him. So that makes him heirs to the promises of my family. The same exact thing happens to us when we were Gentiles, whatever your ethnicity is. When you accept Yeshua and you become saved, you get grafted in, adopted in to the family whose name is Israel, which means you are, have all the rights and privileges. You have all the promises, all of that stuff. It, it doesn't replace Israel. Jeremiah didn't replace me. He got grafted into me. He got adopted into me. He didn't replace me. He's not superseding me. If, you just let, if we could just understand the, uh, how human adoption works, it makes sense what happens when we got adopted into the company when we got grafted into the cultivated olive tree. Again, it's not rocket science, but people – dispensation theology created an identity crisis. It's exactly what it has done. Ah. Uh, now, the Jews are only one tribe out of 12. So unless you have blood ties linking back to one of the 12, I believe you get grafted slash adopted into the tribe of Ephraim. Why? Well, go back and read Genesis. Read, then read Ezekiel 37. There are only two sticks. Which one are you on? And uh, that reminds me of another one I wrote this morning. because I was thinking along the same lines of what I'm reading there uh, called Pick a Stick. And I got the two sticks there, Judah and Joseph slash Ephraim, which is the whole house of Israel illustrated on two, tick, uh, two sticks. And I say, pick a stick. There are sticks in Ezekiel 37, so which one are you on? Since Judah is blood-related and Ephraim was adopted as a half-blood, it seems logical to me that my adoption grafts me onto Ephraim's stick. Now, of course, Judah would be another good option since Yeshua was from the tribe of Judah and our faith is in him. I just think Jacob's prophetic blessing over Ephraim answers some of the questions. To me, the quote-unquote fullness of the Gentiles seems to go back to Genesis 48. And um, I'll read more about that in the other note, um, but specifically verse 19 where it talks about Ephraim becoming a multitude of nations. The Hebrew there is goyim, Gentiles. Okay, Ephraim's going to become uh, the Gentiles. Now, then again, we do have an interesting picture of all of this in Joseph, or excuse me, Joshua and Caleb. Uh, and we're going to get into Joshua and Caleb uh, as we get into the book of Numbers in a couple weeks. Okay, who were these two guys? They were the only two of the original group to enter the promised land, by the way. So think about that. <laughs> Joshua was blood-born of the tribe of Ephraim. Caleb, whose name means wholehearted, was not a natural Israelite, but he was adopted into the tribe of Judah. 
But again, either way, you still have only two sticks picture here, Ephraim and Judah, as the the only two going in to the promised land. All right. Yeah, there's a whole other generation that came up, but they were, you know, all the 12 tribes of Israel, too. But I think there's just a beautiful picture uh, illustrated for us in, in the lives of Joshua and Caleb. Again, represented as Ephraim and Judah. Yahuwah's covenant was and is with Israel. Now, Israel is the 12 tribes, but it is also a term often used for the northern kingdom, a.k.a. Ephraim. So now consider Hebrews 8. Beginning in verse 8. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Here we have again, house of Israel and house of Judah. Israel again also, um, a.k.a. Ephraim, northern kingdom. But uh, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Now, I would believe this is talking about the whole house here. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. This brings us to the issue of whether or not there is such a thing as a Gentile believer. That would appear to be an oxymoron, a contradiction of terms. Consider the fact that Israel was the only nation in covenant with Yahuwah all through the Bible. The Gentile nations were out of covenant. The word Hebrew means crossed over. Thus, if you have crossed over from death to life and have gone from being out of covenant to being in covenant with Yahuwah, it is impossible to remain a Gentile. You are either grafted into the cultivated olive tree of Romans 11, which is Israel, or you remain a branch of the wild olive tree. You cannot be an in covenant slash out of covenant believer. You are either in covenant or you are out of covenant, either still in death or you have crossed over into life. You are either grafted or either still a stranger of the commonwealth of Israel, or you have been brought into it, Ephesians 2 again, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without, without God in the world. But now in Christ, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Made nigh to what? the commonwealth of Israel, who is the church and the covenants of promise, the hope of salvation, cannot be a Gentile believer. You can be a believer of the Gentiles, just like uh, I might say Jeremiah is a skiba of the Garcias. <laughs> uh, you know, that's where he came from. He came from the Garcia background, but he's adopted into my family, so he's no longer a Garcia. He is a skiba of the Garcias. <laughs> So, you know, you may, your heritage may be Gentile, but if you've been grafted in and adopted into the commonwealth of Israel, you're no longer a Gentile. You're a believer who was of the Gentiles. You're not a Gentile believer. So again, I ask, which stick are you on? You better be on one of them, because those are the only two going into the kingdom of the promised land. There is no third stick called the church. All right, let me go back to um, what I was talking about earlier. I, I, just, I was like on a writing rampage this week uh but all these things are coming to me and i think you know maybe i'm just preaching to myself you know and if nobody else was listening i would still be saying this because i need to i need to understand this and fully grasp it myself but i think the body of church needs to get this because there's a severe identity crisis going on um with the body of christ in fact i wrote something about the identity crisis today as well um actually i called it um uh, an epidemic I said, it seems to me that the church has been infected with a very serious epidemic. The side effects of, uh, the side effects of which include, one, amnesia, forgetting who they are, which causes, two, abnormal social behavior, having problems distinguishing what is real slash true, and hearing voices that are not there, leading to, three, severe confusion, and four, delusions of escapism, Imagining they will fly away any day now because they have been, five, believing in false and contradictory doctrine, 
doctrines stemming from six, the identity crisis, see number one, which comes from seven, doctrines that teach against the obedience of Yahuwah's commandments, thus giving license to sin, defined by Scripture as transgression of the law, which equates to eight, rebellion, defined by Scripture as witchcraft, which leads to nine, the paganization of the true faith, which leads to ten, holding to the traditions of men over the word of Yahuwah. If you are suffering from any of these symptoms, please seek biblical attention as soon as possible. Time is running out. There's definitely an identity crisis going on. So, uh, again, I'm going to ask you which stick you're on. There's, there's only two sticks going into the promised land. Stick of Ephraim and stick of Judah. There's no 13th stick called the church. The nations of them that are saved, which are going in and out of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21, are going in through one of the 12 gates. There's no 13th mystical gate called the church. find throughout the entire Bible as Israel. So you will have to go through a gate of Israel to get in to the kingdom. God has one people, one bride, one plan, and it hasn't changed. John Nelson Darby is the one who invented the bogus doctrine of dispensationalism, creating division where there never was before. What's ironic, though, is that most dispensationalists will look at what I'm saying here and accuse me of believing in replacement theology. Um, sorry, but it is the dispensationalist who subscribes to the idea that the church has effectively replaced Israel in the plan of God for the past 2,000 years. Then, after our supposed pre-trip rapture out of here, the unchanging God will change back to dealing with Israel again. It's such a bogus doctrine. I've got a picture uh, that shows um, a cross in the middle, and to the left of it is, is a bar that says Israel, and to the right, a bar that says the church. And, I, and it, so, like, the cross is separating the bar that says Israel from the bar that says the church. If this is what you believe... Prior to the cross, you got Israel. After the cross, you have the church. Then you are the one who subscribes to replacement theology. Now, I understand how seminaries define replacement theology. It's a bit different than that. But n nonetheless, words mean things. If you th And I've heard pre-trib guys on mainstream uh, big-time pro prophecy clubs, and you know who I'm talking about. I've been blacklisted from them. Actually say, you know, for, for during the church age, you know, the church has replaced Israel, replaced Israel in the plan of God, and then they'll backpedal after they hear themselves say it. But, but, but we, we, don't, uh, we don't believe in replacement theology. Well, maybe it's just, a, you know, they, they trap themselves with their own theology because they believe it. They believe the church replaced Israel. That is replacement theology. Again, Paul could not be more clear in Romans 11. The cultivated olive tree is Israel, and its roots are Hebrew, going back to Abraham. Romans 11, beginning of verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold, then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness. If you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those are these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree. This is talking about the natural Israelites coming back to the tree when they believe due to jealousy of seeing those who were once Gentiles reaping the benefits of Abraham's blessings. Romans 11, beginning in verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will, be, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel. So let's come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. The fullness of the Gentiles goes back to the blessing of, that Jacob spoke over Ephraim. I'm going to go ahead and read it now, what I was talking about earlier. Genesis 48, beginning in verse 17. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him, and he grasped his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. 
Joseph said to his father, Not so, father, for this one is the firstborn. Place your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also will become a people, and he also will be great. However, his youngest brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of Gentiles, goyim, nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will pronounce blessing, saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. The multitude of nations are the Gentiles, and I show that that word there is the Hebrew word goy, or, or goyim, uh, Strong's number 1471. Look it up for yourself. Um, this is how God made a people who were not a people into the people of God, which is Israel, as Paul says in Romans 9, beginning in verse 23. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory, even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. As he says in Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, my people, and her who is not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they shall be called sons of the living God. God's people all through the Bible is a reference to Israel. Paul quotes Hosea, describing the fullness of the Gentiles, who are not a people, becoming a people, even the sons of the living God. When the fullness of the Gentiles come into covenant, thus being grafted into the cultivated olive tree, then all of Israel will be saved. First John, or excuse me, John 1, 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Galatians 3, 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. According to Exodus 4, Israel is God's firstborn son. Exodus 4.22 And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Israel is described as God's firstborn son, and Yeshua is described as his only begotten son, John 3.16. And Yeshua came through the lineage of Israel via Judah. So there is only one family of God. You are either part of it or you are not. There is no third-party family running around out there, floating around, called the church. Now let's get back to the issue of Yahuwah's divorcing Israel and how he redeemed his bride. Yeshua said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24. Why did he say that to the Jews? Why the lost from the house of Israel? Both are harlots, but Judah is actually part of Israel as one of the twelve tribes. He came for the whole house because the groom needs to redeem the adulterous bride. Jeremiah 3, 1. They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. But we see that God divorced Israel in Jeremiah 3, 8. And I saw... When for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, adultery, I put her away and gave her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister, Judah, feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Yeshua says in Matthew 5.32, But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, having or saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Okay, so where did Jeremiah and Yeshua get that notion? From the Torah, the Father's marriage contract. Deuteronomy 24, beginning in verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it to her in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. And if... The latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house. Or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. And thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance." Yahuwah married Israel at Mount Sinai. His Torah was the marriage covenant. Through it, he said in Exodus 19, 
beginning of verse 5. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. We see Peter later saying that we are kingdom of priests. Okay? Who is Israel? Only Israel. Only Israel is a kingdom of, of priests. The treasure above all people. The apple of God's eye. Over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. We see that that's Israel. When Israel later began whoring after other gods, Yahuwah divorced her. But that meant, according to God's own law, that she could never return to him and he could never take her back. Yet throughout the Old Testament, we see the prophets declaring that Yahuwah will redeem and take her back. Well, how could that be? Would Yahuwah really violate his own law? Nope. He had an amazing plan in mind, a great mystery, as Paul called it. People say, you know, the church was concealed in the Old Testament, revealed in the New Testament. Well, that's maybe partially true, but the great mystery wasn't that God was going to invent something new in Acts 2. It was that he was going to... The mystery was, how is God going to take his bride, divorce his bride, and then take his bride back and not violate his own commandment? That was the mystery. Everybody's scratching their head going, well, you know, he says you can't take back a whoring bride, yet the prophets say he's going to take her back. How could that be? How could he... How could he divorce her and get her back and not violate his own law? That was the great mystery, and Paul figured it out. It's one of the reasons why I absolutely positively love Paul and why I distance myself from the Hebrew Roots Movement, because there are many people in the Hebrew Roots Movement that think Paul is an absolute heretic, and that we should pay no attention to the 14 books or so that he wrote. Uh, that's one of many reasons I myself from the Hebrew Roots Movement. I love Paul. Paul's awesome, and I'm finally starting to get Paul. It took a guy like Paul uh, to put all this stuff together because he was a doctor of the law. He was a scholar. He was – his pedigree, uh, you know, circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, and Pharisee of Pharisees, studied under Gamaliel. This dude knew what he was talking about. You know, not to cast anything down on the other disciples, but let's face it. They were unlearned men. You know, Scripture even tells us that. They were fishermen, you know, tax collectors and whatnot. It took a scholar – of the what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the, the 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 Law and the Prophets and the Psalms, it took a guy like Paul to put all the pieces together for us so that we can understand the great mystery of how God is going to redeem the bride that he divorced without violating his own law. Though a man can divorce his wife, she cannot remarry, for despite the marriage contract which is easily broken, the two become one flesh. That is not something that can be separated so easily. If she remarries, she causes the other man to be an adulterer, and she can never return to her first husband, for she has been defiled by the last husband. This problem remains in effect until the original husband dies. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39 says, The wife is bound by the law so long as the husband lives. But if her husband is dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Now watch this. Romans 7, beginning in verse 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how, now he's talking to, the, you know, he's the apostle to the Gentiles, and the Romans are Gentiles and all that, but he's saying, look, uh, those of you who know the law, pay attention here. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth? For the woman, which hath an husband, is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, who is the other? Even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Did you catch it? The adulterous wife, in this case Israel, was freed from the curse of the adultery by the death of Christ, who is the word of Yahuwah made flesh. Thus the Father redeemed his bride, Israel, through Yeshua. Guys, this is the most amazing love story ever. In order to get his bride back, the groom had to die. The Holman Christian Standard Bible renders Romans 7 verse 4 a little clearer to understand. It says, therefore, my brothers, you also 
were put to death in relation to the law through the crucified body of the Messiah so that you may belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we may bear fruit for God. Now, this makes Paul's words to the Ephesians make a whole lot more sense. In Ephesians 5.25, where he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This verse explains why Yeshua said what he said in Matthew 15.24. He loved his church, the bride, which is Israel, as confirmed by Revelation 21 and many other scriptures, so much that he gave his own life to redeem her back to himself. It's it's sort of like the 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 loophole in his own law that he created. You know, of course, he had this plan right from the beginning, what he was going to do, because Yeshua is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So it wasn't like, you know, God said, "Oh man, I divorced Israel, but I said I couldn't take her back. So what am I going to do?" No, he had a big plan right from the beginning, a great mystery that Paul figured out, and and because of Paul, we can figure it out. This is the reason why Gentiles get grafted slash adopted into this family. To be the bride is to be Israel, which was redeemed unto Yahuwah by the death of the husband. Gentiles were never in covenant to begin with. Gentiles are out of covenant people. When you accept Christ, you cross over, which is what the word Hebrew actually means, from death to life. Once you do that, you are grafted into the cultivated olive tree, which is Israel. More specifically, you are adopted in through the family name of Ephraim who was himself adopted by Jacob from Joseph to be his own. Once you understand the above, you realize that Darby was way off base. His dispensation theology messes up the entire plan of Yahuwah as clearly laid out in the scriptures and serves only one purpose, to justify the equally bogus and unbiblical notion of a pre-trib rapture. Guys, once you understand that, that he divorced his bride and he could never take her back according to his own law except that he die, unless you understand that, and, and dispensation theology robs us of that understanding. It creates an identity crisis and throws the entire plan of God out the window and nullifies the mystery uh, that Paul figured out. I'm, I'm finding myself like passionately at war with uh, Darbyism. Not because I'm trying to win an argument. I don't, you know, I don't care. Yes, I like the debate. So what? It's not about that. It's about, folks, we've got to realize who we are. This is going to get serious real quick all right, uh, in the days ahead. You know, whether we have a couple of years, as some people think, or left, or whether we have 19 more years, as I believe, or even more. It doesn't matter. Things are coming down that are going to be pretty rough. And unless we're on his page and know who we are and, and, and know what the appointed times are, which we're going to cover today in this evening's study, uh, last week we did, we, we talked about the Feast of Yahuwah, the Moedim. We're going to talk tonight about the Jubilees. Unless we understand that God has a script, and there are key markers on that script, on that timeline, that, that are very important. You know, when you're an actor, you know, in the camera especially, uh, they have marks on the floor. An actor has to hit his mark appropriately, accurately, uh, or he's out of focus, you know, or he's not even in the frame, not even in the shot. And if an actor misses his mark, he may not even be in the picture. Well, hello. What do you think is going to happen to us in the last days if Yahuwah has a plan and Yeshua is the main character and he knows his line and he hits his mark every time and he's going to hit a mark at a very specific time. And if we're uh, doing the Mikra, the rehearsal of the Moedim, the appointed times, then we'll be in the same place at the same time in the picture with him. But if we're not, then we're not even going to be in the picture. You're going to be like the foolish virgins that don't have the the oil with them, with their vessels and their lamps. And you're going to be knocking on the door going, hey, you know, let us in. And he's going to say, hey, you depart from me. I never knew you. You guys didn't pay attention to anything I said. You don't look like mine. John says, if you say I know him but don't keep his commandments, you're a liar and the truth's not in him. Yeshua says, hey, many are going to come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we preach? Didn't we do this? Didn't we heal people? Didn't we yada, yada, yada? And he's going to say what? Depart from me, you workers of Torahlessness, lawlessness. People who think, oh, I'm a New Testament Bible-believing Christian. I don't need the other two-thirds of the book or three-quarters of the book. This is important. I just, I, you know, there's like this fire inside of me that's like, oh, guys, we've got to understand this. i got to understand this. I'll preach to myself if I have to. 
Because this bogus doctrine of dispensation theology robs us of our identity. It allows people to look at Matthew 24, where in verse 29 it clearly states that Yeshua won't be in the clouds, where Paul says we will meet him at the Arpazo of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, until after the tribulation of those days. Not before. Uh, and of course, that causes people to create a fictional um, pre-trib rapture, where if they look at Matthew 24, well, that's just for the Jews. Uh, you got to know your audience, right? Well, sometimes you saw the Bible talking about the church, and sometimes the Bible's talking about Israel. Hello? We're in the same. Church is already gone by this point, they'll say. And, and it's so bogus, because I'll tell people, okay, look, even if you're right, even if the conversation on the Olivet Discourse, Luke 21, Matthew 24, even if that is directed only to the Jew, and there is another entity called the church out there. What did the disciples, the Jewish guys, ask him? They asked him, hey, what, what are the signs going to be of your coming? Don't you think a, like a ridiculously, massively huge sign for him to mention first would be, okay, Jews, when you see oh, several million of my followers lifting up into the sky, uh that'll be your first clue that the next seven years are really going to suck. Right? Like, that's a massively huge sign to conveniently leave out. The whole thing is an argument for, from silence and a distortion based on an identity crisis. And, and there are ministries out there that, like, their whole thing is wrapped up around the preacher of rapture, and if you're not on that page, then you're the heretic. <laughs> like, guys, we've got to figure out who we are. Separating the church from Israel causes all kinds of problems with reconciling the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, and it totally nullifies huge sections of the Book of Romans and other books as well. There's only two types of people in the world, and i got a graphic showing that. Um, there are only two types of people in this world, saved, which are the adopted and grafted, and unsaved, which are those who were either part of the tree that have been removed, or those who were never part of the tree to begin with. That's it. Two types of people. Two types of people. Believe in Yeshua as your Lord and Savior, then you, dear brother and sister, into Israel. And it's time we end this Darby-induced identity crisis once and for all. And uh, for whatever reason, I just, that seems like this is my part of my calling right now. Because so many people I know are wrapped up in this identity crisis and they have no clue no clue what, what's coming. They have no clue who they are. They think, why do I need to know any of this stuff that you're talking about? Because we're not going to be here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, it's the Apostle Paul. Again, you know, I love, 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 love Paul because he's the one that helps us understand all this stuff. He's the one that said that these things happen to them to serve as an example, right? To serve as examples to us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So if we want to understand the end of the ages, we've got to go back to the Torah. We've got to go back and understand what's being said there, because they were four examples for us. 